So I'm down at the garden. Well, I have been most of the day because I've been planting stuff. It's like unseasonably cold right now. I think the high was like 70 today. It's so weird. Um, but anyway, I was doing my little like walk around and look at stuff uh, because I've been tying up tomatoes and I've been planting. And then I was walking down the cucumber rows because they're starting to get big enough now that I have to kind of train them up the trellis because cucumbers are going to want to like grow flat so I just point them in the right direction and once they uh, grab hold with their tendrils they tend to climb up and soon enough they will be up and over. I can't wait. I'm so excited. But we were looking at the potato row and I'm not going to lie to you. I was digging around to see if I could spot any potatoes and there's already like good sized potatoes on some of these. But I noticed um there's like a line of potatoes that have some kind of disease i know that potatoes i don't know that much about potato diseases so i'm not gonna lie to you but if i had to pick one i would guess blight because the leaves are kind of spotty and yellow and the plants just look awful and it's only on some of them so i was just gonna pull up the disease plants so that they don't um touch their neighbors and get their yucky on their neighbors because like a lot of these potatoes look really good. Um, this is probably the best crop of potatoes I've ever grown, which is good because I planted 100 pounds. So if it was crappy, um, that would be sad. But I wanted to get my camera because and document it because why not? Um, and I've already pulled up some plants. And look at all the little baby potatoes on here. So these are like what you would get at the store called new potatoes, like the little fresh ones. They are delicious because their skin is really soft and they're just like really soft and buttery um, texture. Ooh, you can see something's been munching on this one because I haven't had to use a fork. I planted it, them in the trenches and then um, with the potato in the bottom of a trench and then I topped it with compost and it's super easy to pull out and the potatoes are really clean, um, which is really nice. Digging potatoes is like one of my favorite uh, garden activities because you don't know what's under here. It's a mystery. So when you pull it up, you don't know if you're getting one or 10 or none. See this right here, how like yucky and dead. I mean, potatoes naturally die back uh, at the end of their life cycle and that's how you know when to harvest them. But when you planted rows of them, as you can see behind me, and only a couple are turning yellow, that's a bad sign that something funky is going on. And so I just went ahead and pulled these out um, which is perfectly fine because for the next couple days we're going to have delicious new potatoes. So it was in this area that I'm standing in and then kind of in a line you can see that one and that one and one over there. So instead of letting it spread around I'm just going to pull those plants up. I feel like that's my safest option right now. Um, like this guy just looks sad. This is so fun. Potatoes really are one of my very favorite crops to grow. Um, because here in the Midwest, we like a meat and potato dinner. We eat potatoes like um, at least five times a week, probably. <laughs> and plus, you know what feels really fun? When you're making dinner and literally every single thing came from your farm. and. I've had to like remember the joy in that because more often than not we're eating at least over 50% on um, every day uh, food that we grew or you know some dairy that technically we grew um, I'm I remember like back when I first started how exciting it was to make dinner and point out like 
I grew that and these are the eggs from our chickens and I grew that and it was like little things like herbs to the dinner or like greens but it was so exciting and so new and different and it felt really good to know that you provided that for your family you knew exactly where it came from it didn't trek any miles to get to your um, plate it came right from your backyard and while um, obviously my my plot is a little bigger than a backyard right now um, it's good to re reminisce kind of on like where you started and like look around and see where you are now like we are growing so much food and I guess I'm just giving myself a little pep talk right now because it's easy to get sidetracked or get distracted by what other people's highlight reels look like on the internet and how you're comparing yours to theirs, but at least today it feels really good to dig our own potatoes. Well, I think I got the majority of the diseased ones, but do you want to see my potato haul? You know what's going to make me mad? If I go... If I leave these plants in, because they still have another like month or so before they're really all the way mature. If I go to pull it up and something has been eating them underground, I'm going to be very angry at whatever that was. And I hope that it's only... I don't mind sharing a little bit with a little critter, but um, there's no way it can eat almost 800 feet of potatoes, right? Right. Hopefully. Isn't it crazy how this just one little piece of a potato and like look at all the little babies that could have been. But it's just crazy that um, this produces so much food. I think I forgot to say it, but this is um, Yukon Gold. Super popular variety. In the past years, I've grown like a lot of kind of like gourmet type potatoes. Um, like the little fingerlings and I can't even remember what I grew but um, but this year I kind of just wanted to have like the staple potatoes and when I think of what I like to eat and what we like to eat and cook with and it's I love like golden potatoes yellow potatoes and um, red potatoes are our favorite so I grew half Yukon gold which is what this is and half uh, red Pontiac. Both I think technically are mid-season so I think it takes about 90 days to maturity and I'll have to look it up but I can't remember when I planted these potatoes but they're getting close. They're probably only like anywhere from two to four weeks away from when I would be pulling them at their full size. So this is my little potato haul. This is like three-ish plants that I pulled up. Maybe four. Um, but this is going to be delicious. Before, I noticed that all the potatoes needed attention. Or that a few potatoes needed attention. I was out here kind of um, giving my cucumbers a little pep talk about how they should travel up this trellis instead of laying on the ground. And I was noticing tons of little tiny baby fruit. A lot of times when your cucumbers and squash and things um, that have male and female flowers, a lot of times when they first start to put on flowers, you'll notice that they're all male flowers. It takes a little bit longer for the female flowers to start showing up, um, but you do need both a male and female flower on a squash or cucumber or watermelon, stuff like that. You need both because um, they're not like tomatoes and peppers, which have just one blossom that have both female and male parts. They have separate male, male and female flowers. So if you're having a hard time getting your squash pollinated, like if your squash is growing and then all of a sudden the, black, the end turns black and shrivels up, it's usually a pollination issue. It kind of looks like blossom end rot in a tomato because the uh, bottom part turns black, but usually it's just uh, your flower of your female plant did not get uh, pollinated. So this is a male. Whoop. 
This is a male cucumber flower. It does not have a fruit on the end. And how I know that it's a male flower is because if it was a female flower, so this one's a female because it has the flower and the fruit behind it. The male cucumber flowers look like this. And if you look, this is as far as I can zoom in, so I'm sorry, but <laughs> there is no fruit behind that flower. It's just a flower. Whereas this one has a tiny little cucumber. And the sad thing is, is that um, with everything happening in the world, lack of habitat, people spraying is the main thing. Here, um, a lot of our pollinators are disappearing and people are having pollination issues that never had them before. Um, but what you can do is you can take off a male cucumber flower and kind of peel back until you just find the reproductive part of the flower right here in the center and that's what has the pollen on it and you can physically you can take your female flower and your male flower and you can just self pollinate so you just rub the male part of the flower right here in the center like that and that kind of guarantees your pollination now I don't I don't take these steps. For one, I have way too many plants to be hand pollinating all of them. But for two, I haven't found a huge pollination issue. Um, but if I did, that's what I would do. And you can do that on a lot of different things like zucchini, winter squash, watermelons, cucumbers, thing in the, things in like the curcubit and the melon family. They're super easy to hand pollinate. I need to come down and weed my cabbages again because it's starting to get a little weedy. I try to weed at least once a week and that tends to like keep the bulk majority down but there's always a few stragglers. Um, but what I'm surprised about is how little damage that I have from the cabbage moth, like those little white moths that lay the eggs that turn into the little green caterpillars were awful. I planted a fall crop of cabbages last uh, summer and they were riddled constantly having to pick them off and spray BT and this year out in the field I planted them you know a spring crop of cabbages and it's really not too bad. It's like manageable amount of caterpillar damage. Um, I hope I'm not jinxing myself and like cut to two weeks and I have like lace cabbage. <laughs> But uh, if you are in an area, and I've pretty much come to the terms with I'm not spraying anything um, at all, organic or not, I usually don't spray. Um, but if you're in an area with heavy caterpillar uh, worm or cabbage worm damage, I would plant red cabbages. So like the, and for one, look how beautiful they are. I mean, this looks so beautiful, so pretty. The color, there's got to be something different about it because the cabbage worms usually leave these alone. There might be a hole or two here and there, but for the most part, these are um, pretty much bug free. Now, whereas you come down here to these cabbages and like you'll have one, this one looks pretty good. This one has a couple holes, but not nothing too crazy. Um, and so I'm really excited about our cabbage harvest. But how you tell if a cabbage is ready to pick is you just kind of squeeze it. So I would come down here to this plant and I would just squeeze it. And if the head, ooh, this one's firm. And basically if the heads of the cabbages are firm, you can pick it because it'll be a nice tight cabbage um, in the center. So you could let it get bigger or you could keep it small. Now with uh, summer cabbages, like spring cabbage that you planted in the spring and are harvesting in the summertime, those are more time sensitive than if you planted it in the summer for a fall harvest um, because they are actually cooler weather plants so they can handle the fall with you leaving them in the field 
a lot better than they would handle you leaving them in the heat of the summer. So I'm just going to keep my eye on these now that I know that they're starting to head up. If I come down and check them about once a week, uh, I should be able to get them in the right timing. I was meandering through the potatoes earlier looking for the ones that looked sickly so that I could pick them. And I came upon this plant. It's growing like a weed and it actually, it is weed I guess, but um, it's an edible weed. It's called lamb's quarter. It's kind of like wild spinach, but it's covered. It's absolutely covered in these little black bugs like I've never seen before in my life. A good thing to do when you see a plant that is covered in a pest, but the pest is only on that one plant and it's not harming the plants around it, is I just leave it there. And so instead of pulling this weed, I'm just gonna leave it because obviously the pests are attracted to this and not to my potato plants. And plus, I think it's already got its own, um, bioavailable predatory system happening right now and I thought that, that was so cool because I'm a nerd like that. There were two earlier but I don't know if you can see this. There's a ladybug and I bet that little lady is munching on these little black bugs. And I think that's super cool because it's almost like nature's defense system is working right now. Um, so I'm just gonna leave her be. I bet she's there. There was two earlier, so the other one must have either hid or flew off. I know that ladybugs eat aphids, but I don't think these are aphids. Unless I just don't know what an aphid looks like, but I thought they were little tiny green things. One of the reasons why I'm not spray, I'm choosing to not spray anything, um, organic or not, is because uh, the less you spray, the easier, the natural systems can take over. So if you're spraying a pest, um, then the predator for that pest is not gonna come to your place to end the life cycle. <laughs> I've got a kitty. Uh, so all of these things are supposed to work together. If your soil is healthy, if the microbiology in your soil hasn't been like disturbed or killed off or, um, all the organic matter in your soil hasn't been used up so that the microbes left or were killed off. Um, it all starts from the ground up. So if your soil is healthy, your plants are going to be healthier. Um, the more stress a plant has, the easier they are susceptible to pests and disease, um, which it's not an instant fix. You can't just decide one day that you're not going to spray anything and expect it to be sunshine and rainbows because it's not. But by not spraying anything and not intervening, um, I am letting nature run its course. That might be more bugs um, and more a little bit more pests, but maybe by leaving uh, nature alone and letting it run its cycle kitty uh, I think that more predatory bugs will come to eat uh, the pests that I don't want and then the birds will come to eat those and it's just this whole life cycle of things and so I want my little piece of land to be kind of a sanctuary to let everything uh, exist in nature I mean, obviously I am intervening because I'm planting annual crops here and things like that, but I want it to be kind of a sanctuary for everyone to belong. The bad bugs, good bugs, and everything in between. Because the more good bugs there are, the less bad bugs there are. But I think my little um, garden walk is going to be done for the evening because I've got to go in and cook dinner. Um, but thank you guys for walking around with me. And one of these days, sooner or later, I'm going to do a garden tour. I am. Um, and then I'm going to do them weekly. <laughs> so keep your eyes out for that. I'll take you around the whole... That You might need two hours to do that at this point. I did calculate it. And I have got 
three quarters of an acre in growing space this year, which is absolutely insane when you say it out loud. And it's just me managing it. I don't have any employees, unfortunately. Um, but time is of the essence here. Uh, I don't have any to waste. So I'm going to hop off here and go cook dinner and edit and do everything else I got to do in a day. But thank you guys for watching. Until next time.